Okay. So I guess we could begin. So we will make it a point to try to start at 7.17 each time. And uh, that should be enough time for everybody else who would like to join us to catch up. So I guess we could probably begin. So welcome everyone to tonight's uh, first tutorial for Laws 12.070. And this will give us an opportunity to have a sense of international law in the modern context. And I am more than sure that as a result of the U.S. elections last night or yesterday, which were won by Donald Trump, who is now the new president of the United States, the 45th president of the United States, and the first reality star, his election will have a lot of broad implications actually in relation to international law. So for example, um, I came across the news that the, the Israeli government was saying that the Palestinian state issue will cease. So there was a point uh, as a result of the actions of uh, Barack Obama and um, President Clinton to ensure that there is a Palestinian state. And on the basis of the, the decisions of Donald Trump, which oftentimes are erratic and oftentimes through that basis, there is now a sense that there will no longer be any Palestinian state. So that is, that is an implication on uh, international law. There's also the issue about the, 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 um, the expectation that it is okay, for example, for Japan, in one of the statements, he is saying that it is okay for him, for Japan, to uh, have act to to be, become more militarized, despite the fact that it is one of the conditions of the Japan, Japanese surrender after World War II that they cannot really strengthen themselves militarily so that they will cease to be less aggressive. So that's another issue. There's also the question about uh, the relationship between the United States and Russia, because it would seem that uh, Donald Trump, at least President Donald Trump now, uh, President-elect Donald Trump, looks favorably at uh, Vladimir Putin, the President of Russia. And this has implications about the aggressive uh, approaches of Russia, for example, in terms of invading Ukraine and um, capturing part of uh, the Crimea Peninsula, which is actually a part of a territory of Ukraine. There's also that aspect about uh, being more aggressive in terms of uh, dealing with Mexico and the illegal immigration issue. So because of these changes, and it could be, there's also that aspect in relation, for example, to climate change, because Donald Trump doesn't believe that the global warming is actually a result of uh, man-made activities. So he's blaming it on something else despite science. And what would be the implications of that, given the fact that it was only very recently, I think it was only last year, that the United States signed the, the global accords, or actually in Paris this year, uh, agreeing to comply with certain requirements about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, I mean emissions. So therefore, we now realize that, and I think a lot of you, I'm sure, we're quite uh, focused on what is happening in the United States because it has broad implications on everyone else as far as um, international law is concerned. So, and... Uh, I think a lot of you would also have come across uh, issues about extrajudicial killings happening in the Philippines, where to date, about less than four months from the time that the newly uh, installed president, uh, Rodrigo Duterte, was sworn into office, there have now been about 4,000 individuals who have been killed as a result of his state-sponsored policy of killing those who are suspected of being involved in drugs. It doesn't matter 
uh, the kind as to the type of drugs you're involved with, it could be marijuana, which in some United States states uh, is actually legal as far as the usage is concerned, or even, for example, in the Netherlands, the use of marijuana is legal. But to Duterte, the fact alone that you're in, you're, you're, you have access to marijuana that can uh, allow uh, some of his uh, police henchmen to actually sum summarily execute you. And the, the more troubling aspect is that uh, the people are being gunned down in the, in, the, in the Philippines. These are people who have been suspected not of just pushing drugs, but even of using drugs. So those who are suspected drug addicts are getting killed. So the relevant question is because Duterte has been saying that he is immune from criminal prosecution for his actions. Because of what we know about the issue, about the principle of state immunity, would he be correct? So the principle of state immunity, as we will more, uh, as we will examine in detail later on, tells us that a state uh, is immune from the jurisdiction of another state. That's the principle of state immunity. And obviously, a state acts through the instrumentality of government officials. So by extension, therefore, if Barack Obama uh, ordered the, uh, and he did not, I think, ordered the um, abuse or even the torture or the waterboarding of uh, suspected Abu Ghraib terrorists, the question then is, is he immune from criminal prosecution by an international criminal court? And can uh, Duterte, therefore, make the same claim that on the basis of the principle of state immunity, he is immune from criminal prosecution? So these are some of the topics that we can be confronted with in terms of studying public international and human rights law. So tonight, uh, what we're going to do is to be able to discuss and explain the relevance and importance of international law identify the subjects of international law, distinguish international law from private international law, as well as explain the nature, legal basis, and limitations of international law. However, before I do that, oh, and I should have told this in advance, all our uh, tutorials are actually being recorded to enable those who couldn't join the tutorial to then have a look at what was being discussed. So uh, be aware that all tutorials are being recorded. And so, which means that, and all the tutorial recordings will be uploaded in YouTube. And so, therefore, if you prefer uh, not to become visible in these recordings, then you're going to have to turn off your, your um, videos. But then again, you know, that shouldn't really be much of a concern because I'm sure a lot of you have Facebook and, you know, you've got a public profile there somewhere. So I'm hoping that you don't have to turn off your videos and all of you are, uh, you know, uh, should be quite exposed to the idea of uh, being seen by a lot of people. So that's one. Now, but before I start discussing, uh, you know, these topics about international law, I'd like to give you the opportunity to ask questions if you might have any. Would you happen to have any questions, anything that you'd like to clarify? And then I'd like to talk a bit about uh, the assessment as well and explain it, provide some explanation as to the assessment that we have for this course. Would any of you have any questions or comments before we continue? None so far? Okay. Let me just give uh, a brief explanation of as to the nature of the assessment uh, as a by way of uh, trying to encourage you to really complete this course. So in the past, so I've been teaching in the law discipline for close to three years now, my favorite assessment method is a legal memorandum, is the preparation of a legal memorandum, or, and rather, and um, a final take-home assessment paper. Now, the commonality uh, of these two assessment methods is that they are typically, uh, they, they, they typically require a student to answer problem-based questions. And because these assessment methods involve answering problem-based questions, 
as is usual in uh, law courses, the answers are typically according to the IRAC format or the CIRAC format. So you've got the initial short conclusion, identification of issues, articulation or statement of the rules and the legal principles, and then applying those rules to the facts, and then coming up with a conclusion. The problem, however, that I observed in using this assessment method for the past three years has been that many of the students struggled with the assessments and uh, they found it they found my assessments quite difficult and as a result the completion rates of my courses have been quite but have been lower uh, in comparison to other courses so the, the failure rate can be considered to be high many students fail um, and I sense that perhaps there might be a different way of assessing students as to their knowledge about particular law subjects. And so what I've done uh, as a way of hoping that there will be more students who will successfully finish the course or complete the course. So you can be clear that my intention in changing the assessment regime is to enhance the completion rate of students. So I'm doing this because I want more students to pass. So in the past, a lot of my students failed, okay? So I decided to come up with, and this is part of a, of a research project actually. So I've come up with an integrated assessment scheme uh, whereby, as you know, uh, you have a group assessment which relates to a group discussion, then you're required to come up with a group web page, and then finally you have an individual research essay. But the advantage of uh, this, this set of assessments is that they are integrated, they are related. So they feed off and build on one another. So the topics that you work on in the group discussion, whatever knowledge and research you do for that assessment, you bring on when you work on the web page. So that's neat, right? So it's not like in the past, Whatever topics are covered in a group discussion are different from the topics in the legal memorandum and are different from the final assessment piece. And so therefore students grapple with so many concepts and to a great extent they find, they, 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 they find a lot of difficulty in doing that. Whereas in the scheme that we're doing now, they're kind of, in, well, they are integrated and related. So hopefully, because you're very familiar with a specific topic as you deal with it in the course of the group discussion, you become more excited about the topic, you become more stimulated about the topic, you bring that over as you move on to the next uh, assessment, which is the, the web page, and then you bring that on as you work on the research essay. And then, because these are group assessments, you have the advantage of learning from each other. So the thing we need to learn is that, unlike, for example, uh, the the, the the education systems that we've learned in the past, either in primary or uh, secondary school, where a lot of it is teacher-driven. So that the idea is that, that it is the teacher who is the font of knowledge and is the source of knowledge. What we're trying to do here is to recognize that you are part of a community of learners. And in fact, learning is social. So in other words, learning, therefore, should not just come from me. Learning, in fact, should come from all of us. And that's what happens in the course of a tutorial because students then engage in the discussion, come up with their own answers. So we learn from each other. But more importantly, the effect of the, of the group assessments is that students begin to learn from each other as part of a community of learners. But more importantly, hopefully, they should end up motivating one another so that those students who are less inclined to try to finish the course can hopefully uh, be driven by other students to, you know, move, go on uh, and just complete the course and just, you know, uh, come up with a contribution uh, to the assessment pieces. Okay, so in doing this, therefore, the, because of the group assessment, you help each other, you motivate each other, you help each other in terms of the research, in terms of the learning, you answer each other's questions, you begin to support each other, and you, begin, you become more engaged because there is somebody who is engaging with you. So the engagement, therefore, is not only just, just to be about the topic, but the engagement is really more about social engagement because you're part of a group. Uh, it is also uh, what we might, be, we might consider as authentic learning because 
you're given the choice of topic. And because it is a topic that is most likely relevant to you and you find important, then you find some authenticity, some realness in the topic that you're dealing with, unlike a, uh, in a legal memorandum of assessment or a final take on paper where you, you're given artificial legal problems, which are very, very theoretical. Here, you're dealing with real-life problems that can be of meaning to you. And for that reason, the assumption is, according to research, the assumption is that students become more engaged and immersed in the learning experience because of the authentic authenticity of the assessment. So having said that, I'm therefore hoping that, uh, you know, we have a very high completion rate. If I could see 95% or even 98% completion uh, for this course, I'd be more than happy because that will be a huge departure from my previous experiences. And uh, I would say that I wasn't really happy with a lot of students failing because in the end, I get clobbered in the course evaluations at the end of the term. So students hate me because a lot of them get poor marks. So hopefully I think as a result of these group assessments, most of you will get good grades. We'll get better grades. I think that is my assumption. And because of the good marks you'll be getting, you will like me better. So I think that's my theory. And I hope uh, that will come to pass because it would seem to me that uh, from what I think, uh, much of the course evaluation becomes driven by students being happy with their marks or not. And so I'm telling you now that my expectation is that as a result of this innovative, uh, innovative uh, assessment practice that I'm implementing, uh, there will be higher course completions and better marks for students, and therefore better satisfaction and, for me, better course evaluation. So that's what I'm hoping will happen. Okay, having said that, do you happen to have any questions or comments before we start? Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. I'm confused. It's still 7.34. Any questions or comments before we continue? Manjo, can you hear me? It's Michelle. I could. Michelle, yes. I, um, I read the assessment piece and I laughed at the part where you say self-plagiarism is problematic. Ah. I've never heard of self-plagiarism before. I think that's comical. Yeah. It actually happens all the time. So... In the context of students, self-plagiarism happens when you've used certain materials for a, for a specific assessment. So in this case, it could be the group discussion. You were the author of that. So, that's your, so when you first come up with, with something for the group discussion, that is your original intellectual contribution. But if you use that again, use the same words, use the same sentences for the web page, and particularly if you use it for the research essay, you're plagiarizing yourself. And so therefore, you're not allowed to do that. In fact, the basic rule we have is that, in general, you're not allowed to use uh, an answer you've used in the past. It could be an essay for another, for another course. It's not permitted because that is plagiarism. That's self-plagiarism. Now, in the context of researchers, we are not permitted. So, for example, if I publish something in a journal, I cannot just lift everything and copy everything and use it in another journal or in another manuscript because I will be plagiarizing myself. And that is still, that, that's still uh, intellectual dishonesty. So what is important is that every time you come up with uh, an answer to an assessment, that has to be original contribution each time. Now, let me just point out something for, for some of you who have said, uh, you know, it's something that's unfamiliar. And I'm going to look at the comment of Megan in a short while so that I don't, I don't get uh, distracted. It's actually easy to avoid self-plagiarism. You just either have to paraphrase yourself or rewrite what you write. Paraphrase yourself. Yeah, you paraphrase it. So if you have a paragraph there, you have to paraphrase it, state it in a different way. Because if you just lift it, and copy it on you know, another document, that is plagiarism. But paraphrasing it is fine. Okay, now, what you need to know is that because you're submitting your documents in Turnitin, Turnitin will pick that up. Those similarities will get flagged in the similarity report of Turnitin, and we see them. Okay, so it's actually easy to avoid it, even in terms of... Um, 
even when you try to get something from a judicial decision, for example, uh, it will be helpful to so, so you don't so you avoid plagiarism. It will be helpful to actually paraphrase it. But the key point about paraphrasing is that you're actually able to then use your own words, come up with a statement that supports what you're trying to say. That's the key point. Because if you allow, if you just use what others have written, chances are they're making a statement for another reason. Whereas if you paraphrase the thought that's in that statement, then you're coming up with a statement that supports your, your very own argument. Okay? Now, uh, from Megan, I stopped myself in response on the group discussion the other night because I thought I might need to use that info later. Okay, uh, I'm not sure about the context of, of that one. Oh, was that Megan? I'm not sure I understand that. Uh, I was uh, responding to one of the questions on Moodle about Duterte and uh, I started to go into some detail and I thought, oh, <laughs> I might need it in my assignment. I better stop myself. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The thing about knowledge, and I've had a few questions about some students here who said that they prefer to do the assessments on their own, and it's not allowed. So all the, the first two assessments are group assessments, so you can't do these on your own. The thing I think that we, that we, we can consider is that it's better for knowledge to be shared. It's better for knowledge to be shared. So don't don't hesitate about you know putting information out there because at the end of the day even if people are exposed to the same information or to the same body of knowledge their take out of that body of knowledge is going to be different they're going to come up with a different argument and it will therefore be good if we come up with you know if it's a cumulative, cumulative approach to learning where everybody begins to contribute so don't hold off and in fact, if you will notice, the, only, the, the reason why knowledge becomes expansive and people learn is because academics and researchers are unafraid to share what they know with others. And whatever is out there then triggers some other thought. So I would encourage you to um, be more generous. Don't hesitate to share whatever you've learned. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, there's a huge there's a huge difference between exposing certain ideas and then developing them. Because chances are the ideas that you have right now are quite basic and it will require more time, it will require more research before you can actually come up with an idea that you feel is worthy of being assessed. So the initial ideas that you, that you now have, if you post them in Moodle, you, will, you might just be able to generate some discussion and, oh, okay, so that's the way you should be looking at it, you know, that, that type of thing. Okay, now from Yomi, what if you referenced it? Okay, the other aspect you need to learn is that, let's assume, and this is crucial, um, so let's assume that you have a research essay or let's assume that, you know, you have a group discussion report or something on the web page. If what you do is to copy and paste, for example, statements from others, or even from the courts, so you're, you're copying, lifting paragraphs after paragraphs, and you reference it, fine. There is no plagiarism because you have referenced properly. There is no plagiarism. But there is no intellectual contribution. So plagiarism will mean you will get heavily penalized. If you plagiarize, you will, it will probably lead to an academic misconduct case. However, the problem is, even if you don't plagiarize, by, but what you do is to reference uh, passages that you've just lifted from sources, you don't have an intellectual contribution. Even a young student, as young as five, can copy and paste something off the internet. Now, therefore, you're also being assessed on your intellectual contribution. So copying and pasting will not do, even if you reference it. Okay. I, I'm yes. referring to my own work, like the uh, group I assignment. Uh, if I then put my, if I put it there as what well, I post on the module, yeah. and then I reference myself, will that be? Oh. 
no, had as plagiarism. No, 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 no. You're not permitted to reference yourself. The only time you reference yourself <laughs> is if you published a manuscript, a journal manuscript, or a conference paper or a conference manuscript. Because then, in that case, you know you can reference yourself because that's kind of publicly available. You cannot reference your own work. Now, what you need to remember is that your whatever whatever uh, you submit in the course of our assessments are probably going to be based on research. So because it is based on research, you're probably referencing some source. So, there, so therefore, what it means is that as you work on these different individual, these different assessment pieces, you reference your sources, not your own ideas. Okay? Because the, the other point about intellectual contribution is that not everything that you write can be original. Because if it is original, then my question is, you know, who, what makes you an expert to be able to just write something on your own without relying on the works of other people, without kind of resting on the, on the shoulders of giants before you? So it cannot be totally original on your part because a lot of the knowledge is already out there. And if you don't therefore reference those sources, it means you're not doing research. And then I would say, you know, how can you be saying these things without actually reading up on the topic? Okay. Questions, comments? Hey, Manjo, yes. just in regard to the um, group size, you've got their um, three to five. I'm not right. sure what yes. your size is like. Would you prefer sort of three or five? I think there's an advantage to having five people because just in, so the problem is if you only have three and somehow for whatever reason, one of your group mates decide not to continue with the course, you've got a problem. You're left with only two. So that gives you a buffer. And the other advantage is with the, with the uh, higher, you know, the higher numbers, the load becomes more shared. So there are more people able to do some, to do more work. And so some people could do the writing, some people could do the research, some people could do the website. So the work is spread. There's the added advantage. Plus the fact that with more people in a group, that there, there are more ideas that are being shared and exchanged. So there is an advantage to having more people. So I would, I would say that three is kind of dangerous because if somebody decides to not pursue this course, then you, you've got a problem. Okay. Uh, so f there is a question here uh, about are we expected to draw from various laws, let's say employment law. Now, what we need to remember is that we're dealing here with international law, public international law. So because it is public international law, employment law, which is part of domestic law or municipal law or part of a law of a state, is unlikely to be relevant to international law. So when I speak of international law, I'm speaking of public international law. Because you never refer to private international law as international law. So when anyone says international law, it's always public international law. That's the meaning. So in relation to employment law, therefore, there is no notion of employment law in, in public international law or international law. In terms of slavery, um, I seriously doubt if there is a, a connection between employment, domestic employment law and public international law because the concepts there are totally different. Um, at some point, especially for next week, we'll talk about sources of international law and we will know that one of the sources of international law would be generally accepted principles of law recognized by civilized nations. And in that case, we will learn that as far as general principles of law recognized by civilized nations, what it is actually means is that the International Court of Justice can examine the laws of domestic systems, but only if there is some kind of uh, accepted, there, there, there is a, a recognition that that principle of law, which is present in a domestic system, is actually generally accepted by most nations but not in employment law. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't think that, um, that that will come in handy. Uh, the, the other thing I would like to explain is that when I deal with the tutorials, I would never attempt to embarrass anyone or I would never embarrass anyone. Okay, so feel free to raise anything. Um, and remember, this is a good learning opportunity. So feel free to ask questions, feel free to, and we are really going to be very respectful with each other. 
And I, I would rather that you, you know, you make mistakes in the course of the tutorial, because then that's an opportunity for you to learn instead of making that mistake in an assessment piece or when you practice law later on. Okay, questions, comments before we proceed? So we could probably go on. Okay, so by the way, thanks for joining uh, the tutorial tonight. Let's begin with this question. Is international law important? Can I have volunteers? Yes, it is. Okay, that would be Andrew. Andrew. Yeah, yeah, I'd say it is. Um, obviously, law serves a function in the domestic context of nations, but um, there needs to be checks and balances in mm. the event that someone who uh, is inclined to exceed their, uh, well, take the benefit of the power that comes with being a lawmaker, there needs to be checks and balances on their uh, control, on their power, mm. uh, and there's certain unalienable uh, fundamental human rights that need to be protected that may well, without international law, be, um, be uh, subverted, perhaps. Um, and so international law plays a function in that respect and keeping the checks and balances on on sovereign leaders and, 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 and lawmakers of, of nation states where perhaps they've taken liberties that they probably shouldn't have. Mm, interesting point. So um, Andrew was trying to draw a connection as well, because if you study constitutional law, you know, you have the three branches of government, the judiciary, the executive, and the legislature trying to become a check and a balance on each other. And that raises the question, is there really such a thing as checks and balances in international law? How does that work? So who is the check? I mean, so in, in the first place, so in the domestic system, so when I speak of domestic systems, I'm talking about municipal law systems or in a state or, or a country or a nation. So you do have clear institutions. You have clear government institutions that wield power. So power, the power of government rests in three institutions or branches of government, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. Do we have that same setup in international law so that you can say that the international law power rests with a body? Is there such a thing? Can you actually draw a comparison between municipal law systems as far as power is concerned? Can you draw a comparison with international law and particularly also in relation to checks and balances can i get some comment on that i don't think that you can um i think the international system is it's piecemeal it's i will buy into this and i won't buy into that mm. um there is aspects where people can i guess push different ideals on others but whether that's legal or not i think is quite mm. subjective mm. And th th thank, you, thank you, Michelle, that was very good. And, and thank you, Andrew, by the way. The, so the relevant question is, so, you know, Donald Trump is now the president-elect of the United States, and there is the fear of a lot of people that he can be quite erratic in relation to the way he deals, for example, with Russia, it could be with North Korea or China, and so on. Is there a way for the international community to check the powers of the United States? Or is there... Is there really such a thing as checks and balances in the international legal order on the basis of international law? I think there are, yes. although, although arguably not to the strength that there is in, um, in modern, you know, in, in democratic uh, okay. nation states. You know, checks and balances come in the, in the form of uh, norms. Uh, yes, of, very of good. Red, of, I've read the chapter, chapter one. Uh, yeah, checks and balances come in the form of norms. So, you know, the rejection of slavery, um, mm -hmm. ge genocide, obviously, some other things. So, sure, Donald Trump is an erratic leader, but, um, you know, if he was to embark upon a policy of killing a certain ethnic minority in the United States uh, mm -hmm. because he disliked those persons, then, yeah, and sure, there is checks and balances. Although, from what I read in the text, that those checks and balances perhaps are 
are of less weight or less strength or application to uh, a pretty uh, powerful nation like the United States as they might be as opposed to you know, Sudan or somewhere in, in Central Africa. But, um, yeah, there are checks and balances, but they're uh, perhaps of weaker application than what would be in the case in most, in most states in, in domestic law or under, the, under domestic law. Very good. Now, before I comment on uh, what Andrew said, would anyone care to say, you know, to, to follow on or follow through with what Andrew has just said? Anyone care to comment? Contribute anything else? Um, Michelle? I'm just going to say um, that... Um, Who was that? Although I don't think there's necessarily one body yes. who um, are at the forefront of leading the charge, so to speak, against standing up for um, wrongdoings that they see. Mm. I think it um, is more a case of it takes um, a collective body of countries mm. to say this is unacceptable, um, something's got to be done about this, restrictions need to be put in place, mm. um, possibly sanctions, mm. and take it from there and see what the reaction is, whether they come back and say, well, I don't care what you all think. Mm. We're going to go ahead. Like, I'm particularly thinking of um, the case in the Philippines where mm. there just seems to be this carte blanche mm. policy yes. in government, which is uh, uh, you know, extrajudicial killings, yeah. merely on suspicion without yes. evidence or proof needed. Uh. And that although the president has declared that he himself is immune from prosecution mm -hmm. and he has given a guarantee to police officers mm. that they are immune, but they are also individuals. Mm. And if it were any other case, they would be legally held responsible mm. for their actions on duty. So I think it raises a lot of interesting questions, mm. but I think it takes the force of a number of powers to mm. say, this is not good enough. Very good. Uh, Michelle, I think Michelle wanted to say something. Yes. Yeah, just leading on from what Andrew said about checks and balances, um, it, it seems to me that you can check and you can balance, but the end result in every instance is always violence. Um, <laughs> Do you have a different thought about what to do with the checks and balances if we fall short besides violence? Okay, yeah. So let's go back to the notion of the rule of law. Ultimately, the idea of the rule of law is that, and especially the separation of powers, the idea is that there are institutions or a branch of government that acts as a control, meaning as a check on the power of another. So in the domestic system, it's clear that the three branches of government uh, act as a check and a balance on each other so that they, they act as a control on the powers of another institution or, 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 or on another branch of government to ensure that it does not exceed the exercise of its powers according to law. In the international sphere, as pointed out by many of you, there is actually that element of control. So it may not be in the sense that there are clear institutions that legally have the legal power, therefore, to impose control on, or on, 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 on another institution. But certainly, there are certain controls in international law that act as a check on the actions of a state. So as pointed out by Andrew, for example, there are norms that have to be followed. You have customary international law, which, for example, will, will disallow the use of force. There are certain general principles of uh, international law that have to be observed. There are crimes against genocide, crimes against humanity. And these, therefore, uh, require certain norms of behavior that states must follow, either because they can be subject to criminal prosecution or they can be subjected to uh, con condemnation by the international community. And because every single state in this globalized world, you can no longer say that you know, a, a nation is an island of its own. We're all interdependent. The United States is dependent on China, no matter you know, what it does. It's dependent even on Mexico. Because a lot of people live in Mexico. There's a lot of uh, you know, remittances of funds from one country to the other. 
it's not, and as far as the global chain is concerned, it will require certain raw materials, certain intermediary materials from one, other, from one another state. So it's no longer possible to say, not, not even Russia or not even China, it's no longer possible for a single state to say that they cannot, they don't care about what the rest of the international community says. So not even the United States is immune from the, uh, you know, from what the opinions and the attitudes are of other states. It has to learn to play the ball, to play the game. So for example, the way that the United States may want to deal with Syria, the way it wants to deal with ISIS or ISIL, or the way it wants to deal with Iraq or Iran or Israel, for the United States to be able to move in a certain direction, it is crucial that the United States gains the support of other nation states. And for it to do that, therefore, the United States cannot just use its military might or even its economic might to kind of just push people or push states away and just, you know, kind of uh, bulldoze its way towards a certain outcome. It can no longer do that. Not even Russia can do that. So Russia, for example, uh, will, will probably be dependent on the United States uh, to ensure that it can safely deposit its money in a, in a in a particular enclave, or so that it has access perhaps to uh, certain resources that are in the United States, that it has access to computers or uh, certain, certain raw materials it will need for uh, its military industry and so on. Okay? So very good, so that's right. There is in fact a mechanism as a result of international law that acts as a control on states, even the most powerful states in terms of the economy and the military. So it's no longer possible for any state today to just you know, uh, disregard the rest of the international community. So even the United States, as far, for example, as climate change is concerned, it refused to sign, uh, during the time of President George W. Bush, the Kyoto Protocol, which was a convention as part of the United Nations Convention, Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, it used to be that the United States refused to sign that convention, which would have required the United States to lower its greenhouse gas emissions. But because of uh, international pressure, it was forced to sign the Paris uh, Accord this year. And I don't know what will happen, obviously, with, uh, with Donald Trump presidency because Donald Trump doesn't really believe that climate change or global warming is man-made. Okay. Comments? Other comments about why international law is important? Uh, you, yes. you, will, you will, sorry. Go ahead. Did I interrupt oh, someone? No, no. Oh. Can you hear me? I could hear you, Andrew. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. You alluded to it a couple of times there, another function of international law and it's parallel to a functionality of domestic law is its persuasive factor. Mm -hmm. So sure, while, um, you know, uh, Donald Trump, for example, uh, is free to enact, or not exactly, I fade with the, with the political system in the States, but a, a sovereign leader is, is you know, free to enact laws of, of, of their nation, in their nation, but, um, the, one of the functions of international law is it allows, it, there's a persuasive value to it. So um, if the international community condemns uh, the domestic law or policies of a certain nation, but the international law principles aren't, aren't there in place yet to, to pull them into line, if you like, for want of a better phrase, there is the, the, the persuasive value that uh, the international community will condemn that nation and mm. perhaps impose trade embargoes or, or certain um, restrictions on trading with that, with that country or, or right. other, other things. So it, it also has that persuasive element mm. to it like it, like it does uh, in domestic law. That's right. So the crucial component, I think, the crucial dimension that Andrew was saying here is that Typically, when you speak of law, there is a coercive element to the law. It, law is obligatory. It is coercive. You need to obey it. But people actually behave in a certain way, not only because they are legally obliged to act in a certain way, but they actually do certain things because they are persuaded to act in a certain way because they need to do it. 
So for example, when, uh, if, if, you, if you put it in the context of uh, staying in line, let's say you go to Hungry Jack's and you want to buy something, there is really no law that prohibits people from you know, jumping the line. There is no law that makes it obligatory. But yet, there is a persuasive effect of social norms that we need to behave in a certain way. And particularly in relation to the international community, it is possible to argue that certain norms of behavior are not oblig legally obligatory in the sense that they are coercive, but people need, states need to act in a certain way if they would like to be able to gain the support and cooperation of other states. So there is a persuasive value um, to international law that influences the behavior of states. Okay, thank you. I'd like to move on to question two. Now the question is, in, is international law based on consent? What, what exactly does that mean? Is international law based on consent? Yes, it is. Uh-huh. Uh, I believe because there's no legislature in the global sense, uh, international law is founded through things such as treaties and whatnot. And treaties are things that countries must freely enter into, so they mm -hmm. consent to the obligations that are imposed mm -hmm. upon them uh, when they enter a certain treaty. So mm -hmm. international law is based on consent mm -hmm. in that respect, yeah. Okay, comments from others? Uh, I think that's partially correct. Okay. Is um, that yes. Okay. Sorry, I'm in the dark. I've got my little one trying to sleep on my lap. Yes. Um, it's partially correct because of customary international law as well, uh -huh. which I think has an overlay, uh -huh. which means that if you choose not to buy into a certain treaty, there mm. can still be some obligations mm. if there's norms to that effect. Is that right? Partly. Because it, it raises the question, is customary international law based on consent? No, I don't believe so. Treaties are based on consent. Yes. How, how about, as we will examine later on in, in week two, how, how about customary international law? Because if you examine Article 38, Paragraph 2, Paragraph 1, so Paragraph 2 of the International Court of Justice Statute, uh, we're speaking of internationally, of, of uh, a custom of international law practice by states. So there is state practice, and it can be argued that much of customary international law is actually founded on consent. But the question is, is that really true that international law is really based on consent? So for example, Duterte said that he cannot be bound by, you know, he cannot be criminally prosecuted for his acts of genocide. So some are arguing that the killing of 4,000 individuals in the Philippines constitutes genocide, okay? And he's saying that he cannot be criminally prosecuted for genocide. Is that true? The, no. the norms are an exception to that, to that consent rule. Uh, you can't, consent or otherwise, you cannot, um, you know, you cannot commit genocide and you cannot uh, mm. enact policies relating to slavery. And mm. I'm not sure of what the other norms are, but yes. those are the two that I'd come across. So, um, yeah, look, the entire body of international law is not wholly based on consent. There are That's these right. norms that, that, uh, mm. that, that apply irrespective of consent. And, and I think, as Michelle mentioned, mm. customary, customary law may well not have that element of consent or at least partially anyway. So, mm. yeah, I think, I think it's a mixture of, of, of consent or, and otherwise. Very good. So it is a mixture. So international law is actually a mis mixture of consent either consent as an affirmative consent, such as you know, in, 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 um, in, in entering into a treaty or engaging in consistent state practice that leads to the development of customary international law. However, we do know that uh, international law can also develop even in the absence of consent. So uh, if, if, if you will recall, based on what you've learned about history, uh, after World War II, uh, the leaders of Nazi Germany, as well as the leaders of militarist Japan, were tried uh, either in the Nuremberg trials or the Tokyo trials. They were subjected to criminal prosecution and eventually executed. 
obviously they did not consent to the jurisdiction of these international tribunals. But uh, it, it suggests that even in the absence of their consent to be bound by norms of international law, we do know, part of what is known now as natural law, that there are certain universal international laws that states and the instrumentalities of states must comply with, regardless of their lack of consent. And particularly speak if you speak of peremptory norms of international law. So these are, these are norms that no state is permitted to disavow, permitted not to follow. They are required to follow them, including the rules of genocide or even against um, slavery, for example. Okay, very good. Uh, let's go to discussion question three. Just aware of the time. So I'm using this, this question for the purpose of trying to generate more discussion about the possible topics you have for your assessment pieces. So the question, question three is, what are some key topics of international law that you find relevant and important? Discuss it and explain why. So what have you thought so far? as an interesting topic of international law that you would like to be the subject of your investigation or examination for the purpose of the group assessments and even the research essay? Um, well, I thought um, mandatory detention and refugee status. Ah. Um, one, because it's relevant at the moment. Mm. And two, I think it's going to be a growth area of law. Mm. And there's going to be a lot of change of legislation. Legislation we're seeing it in our own government mm. now, where um, okay. there's further crackdown. Yes. Even though the need for more help, mm. um, for want of a better term, is needed. Yes. Um, many countries are um, tightening their legislation and restricting the movement mm -hmm. of refugees and restricting the entry requirements. Okay. So I think it's um, an interesting time. And I don't think we've really learned from the past. How, how do I pronounce your name? Siobhan. Siobhan. Yes. Siobhan. Okay. So I'd just like to flag a warning that you have to be careful that you're actually dealing with international law. Because your, your, your statement so far indicate uh, an, a, a focus on domestic legislation as far as Australia is concerned. So just be sure that you can actually identify international law, a source of international law. Uh, it's, a treaty is unlikely to be there. So I doubt if Australia, or Australia is, uh, I doubt if Australia, or if Australia or some other Western European state has entered into a treaty concerning uh, the way that they should be dealing with the refugees. So a treaty is, uh, is out of it. Now the question is, would there be some norm, or is, would there be a customary international law relating to the way that um, international refugees should be dealt with? So that's one question you need to examine. It has to be from that, or you can look at it from the viewpoint of general principles of law recognized by civilized nations. So is there a way right now that... Uh, there seems to be a consensus or an agreement among many civilized states or the modern states that there is an obligation that is owned by states to these international refugees. So that's a complex issue because there is a distinction between the so-called genuine refugees and these are refugees fleeing from political uh, persecution perhaps or religious persecution or sexual persecution so those are legitimate uh, grounds to accord a ref an international refugee the status of an international refugee as opposed to what are known as economic refugees. So just be careful about that. So I'm, 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 uh, we're having this discussion just for me to be able to provide you some sense of direction. Mm, okay, thank you. Because a lot of the people, for example, in these, not, I'm not sure if it's a lot, but there are some boat refugees who are just fleeing some countries, some states such as, I don't know, Afghanistan, perhaps Iran, and uh, Indonesia, not because they're, they're being persecuted, but because they want a better life in Australia. These are called economic refugees, and there is nothing in international law, I'm not really sure if it's nothing, but to my knowledge, there is little that would support uh, the, the cause of 
international economic refugees so that there is an obligation on the part of states to afford them protection. So that, that's just by way of kindness. Okay, very good. Chauvin. Okay. Uh, Chauvin, okay. Any other, comp what are the other topics that some of you are considering? Um, our group's talking about genocide. Yes. Um, I've done a little bit of preliminary research and it's really quite interesting. Mm. Uh, not in the obvious sense of your mm. sort of Nazi Germany and yes. your, your recent kind of wars, mm. but to think in terms of um, the stolen generation in Australia also yeah. can be considered to be genocide. I don't think Australians would think about there being genocide on our shores. Um, but another interesting point that I thought was that um, some really big players haven't um, signed on to treaties that you think that they would have. Mm. For instance, the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. Mm. Um, which I find quite concerning, uh, particularly the US and China. Yes. Um, and from what I read, there's many African countries, and at the moment, the only people who have been prosecuted by that court are African nationals. And so they're saying that there's prejudice from big countries versus small countries, which I find really interesting. Mm. And I think that would apply universally to international law. Mm. Yeah. So I think you, refer, you were referring to the International Criminal Court of Justice in particular, where the evidence has been that uh, the ones who have been tried and convicted, or actually tried, have mainly been leaders from African states. And uh, the United States, for example, refuses to submit to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court of Justice, particularly because it will be concerned about the, its abuses, for example, in, the, in Abu Ghraib, and the way that it may have been uh, waterboarding some of the terrorists and so on, or terrorist suspects. Okay, now, so my suggestion for, as well for most of you is that try to make a distinction between the application of international law as opposed to enforcement. So try to deal with them separately because what I, don't, what I want you to avoid is a situation where you, where you say, okay, there seems to be a breach of international law, but enforcement is unlikely in the sense that it may be possible for the United States to be breaching a norm of international law for its behavior in terms of dealing with, um, with the uh, terrorist suspects. So there is a violation. But whether or not uh, punishment can be enforced on U.S. officials is a totally different question because the United States may refuse, have always refused uh, the jurisdiction of an international court. So in that case, it is all right to limit your study to simply the question of the applicability of international law and whether or not there is an international law on that specific topic. And just say that you are not at that point dealing with the issue of enforcement. Because enforcement is a totally different problem in international law. So even the decisions of the uh, International uh, Court of Justice are not self-executory because there is no mechanism by which the International Court of Justice can enforce its decisions. A lot of it depends on the willingness of a state to comply with the decision of the ICJ. Okay, so thank you. Um, yeah, so we've got here a comment from, from RISE. Um, South Africa has just left the International Court of Justice. Territorial expansion from Osilito, per, perhaps human rights international law. Okay, very good. Okay, so it's now 8.15, and I think um, we've covered enough, uh, much of international law, unless you want to go to question four, which is about subjects of international law. You could probably skip that, because uh, it's time for dinner for a lot of us. Okay, would you have any questions before we end tonight's tutorial? And I thank you for your engagement and your participation. Any questions or comments before we end tonight's tutorial? Sorry, Manjo, true to form, I do have something. Um, yes. Are you going to give us a, an explanation about the, the assessment in practical terms? Um, for instance, it says build a website. I don't have any experience with that. Do you have any suggestions no. if there's no one in our group who knows how to do that? You're going to have to um, do it. That's so odd. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> We're trying to force you to learn to uh, learn certain skills. Um, 
it can come right. in handy. Yes, okay. you know, by um, fun, you know, YouTube shows you how. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, all right, let me think of another. It's not that difficult. I mean, if there are five of you, it's not that difficult to be making websites. A lot of people make their own websites now. I have my own website. So you will learn it. Yeah, yeah. A spoiler about Salido, you can try WordPress. A lot of these websites are actually so easy to make. You're just going to have to learn how. And so it's part of the learning so that, you know, you don't just use, learn how to use computers. You have to learn how to build better presentation by having something out there on the internet. Okay. Anything else? Yes. My next question. Yes. Um, so part two of the first assignment mm -hmm. is a Zoom presentation. Um, mm -hmm. And... Assessment two is the web page. Yes. Can you use the content from the first one for the second one, given that you're not doing writing? So we're discussing it. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All right. So that's not self plagiarism. No, 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 no. That's okay. exactly the purpose of the whole thing. They're related. Okay. You're just not allowed to use the same sentences. So you have to okay. write whatever you used in the past. I mean, in the first assessment. You can't reuse those same sentences. You have to reword or rewrite them. Mm -hmm. Because of like self plagiarism. Okay. Any other questions? Man, Joe, this is Osalito. Yes. Osalito, yes. Yeah, our group decided to choose the topic territorial expansion, particularly the island building of China, somewhere in Sprati Island. Yes. But I think the issue has been decided by the by the international court. So, are we yes. allowed to? Yeah. Topic. Yes. Yeah. Certainly. Yes. So the purpose there in that case is to uh, elucidate, enlighten the rest of us what that topic is all about, what China is doing, yeah. and what exactly is the decision of the uh, international tribunal there. So you. Yes. you yeah. Yeah, so in that case, basically there are few submissions that the Philippine government has raised. So mm. can we choose few submissions instead of selecting or? discussing all the submissions? Uh, uh, given the fact, obviously, given the fact that there is a limited terms of the word count, then you need to choose uh, which sources you're willing to cite. So it's perfectly within your control to determine, uh, you know, what submissions you want to focus on. Because you have a word count. Because remember, you're required to submit a word document as part of that assessment task. And there is a word count limit, which you cannot go beyond. So you have to pick and choose uh, which are relevant and important to you for the purpose of uh, elucidating uh, a specific topic, such as the one about, you know, the, the Sprati Islands and so on. Okay, thank you. And welcome, by the way. I think you're a Filipino, aren't you? Yeah, I am. Okay, so welcome. Anything else? Man, Joe, as far as submission goes, yes. um, it's a group assignment. Does each person in the group submit the same thing or does one person in the group submit for everyone? Yeah, so there is just one submission for the entire group. So you could probably, you should be designating a single person who will do the submission for the group. Perfect, thank you. So I guess that's it. Okay, so um, welcome again to uh, our first tutorial for Lost 12070 and I look forward to uh, engaging with you more in the coming weeks. And I look forward to most of you or all of you successfully completing this course. Okay, so thanks everyone. Um, enjoy your dinner and enjoy the rest of the week. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.